Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenters, Richard Garner, former Product Director for IP Solutions, and Mike Huddleston, IP Product Planning Director for LexisNexis IP. Thank you to everyone for attending today's presentation. With that, I will turn it over to you, Richard. Um, thank you, Gail. Hello. Uh, so, as Gail says, I am Richard Garner. Um, I am actually now retired from LexisNexis. I retired at the end of 2015. Hence this photograph of me on the left, uh, looking very relaxed and having nothing more on my mind besides whether to have beer or wine with my dinner. Prior to my retirement, though, I had been active in the IP information industry, both the public and private sectors, since the mid-1980s. And during that 30-year career, I witnessed many changes, uh, including the huge growth in web-based pattern research solutions among the so-called free and commercial services. The aim of today's webinar is to look at some of the more popular free sites in use in the United States and Europe in order to highlight just a few of their strengths and weaknesses and to contrast them with some commercial services. I'm aware that there are also many free sites beyond the US and Europe, but as we largely have a North American audience today, they're the regions that I'm going to focus on. As Gail has said, please feel free to raise questions during the presentation using the chat feature and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. I'm also joined today by Mike Huddleston. Um, Mike is the IP Product Planning Director for LexisNexis. And as you can see by Mike's photograph, he's still enjoying himself way too much to be considering retirement. One of the things that Mike keeps, uh, one of the things that keep Mike looking so useful is directing the development of a new patent research tool. And later on, he's going to show just how far patent research tools have come since the early days by introducing you to the latest tool in the LexisNexis ReadTech IP product portfolio, Total Patent One. As some of you may have seen in the blog that was posted a few weeks ago promoting this webinar, the concept of free patent information databases began in the mid-1990s. Questel Orbit, one of the pioneers of online patent information, launched their QPAT service in 1997, offering, if my memory is correct, free access to front page information of US patents with paid access to the full text and PDFs. But in my opinion, it was IBM with their patent server project which really kick-started the trend towards making patent information freely available. IBM's intellectual property network, as it was later known, before being spun off as the commercial service Delphion, was the brainchild of Dr. Stephen Boyer. In 2014, Dr. Boyer was named as the International Patent Information Award recipient for this and other key accomplishments in the field of patent information. And to quote from the award citation, the patent world was greatly turned on its head as full text information was suddenly made available to anyone with a computer and for free. Before the IBM patent database went online, most people had limited access to patent information. Apart from the professional searching of index databases, or visiting a patent office's uh, library's public search room. The creation of IBM's intellectual property network was the first time that US and international patent documents had been made widely available electronically on a single platform. And this required the unprecedented liaison between the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the European Patent Office, and various national patent offices. The IBM initiative fundamentally changed the way people searched and accessed patent information globally. And again, in my opinion, prompted, encouraged, embarrassed, 
several of the major patent offices in the world to launch their own services on the internet. Among the most heavily used today is the USPTOs, which now allows free searching of full text US patent applications and granted issued patents. But as is noted on the PTO site, while the full text of applications covers publications from 2001 onwards, the full text coverage for issued US patents is only from 1976. Patents from 1790 through 1975 are searchable only by issue or publication date, patent number, and current US classification. But as we all know, I'm sure that system has now been replaced by the cooperative patent classification system largely. The USPTO site supports quick, that is simple searching, using one or two terms or phrases, and the user can choose to search all fields or select an individual field from a drop-down that includes various names, dates, numbers, classes, etc. Users can also run their search against one or other text field, such as the title, abstract claims or description, but not combinations of these, at least not on the quick form. The form also gives the user the option to combine their searches, um, combine their terms using logical Boolean operators, and, or, and not, but not with proximity operators like near or within. In this first example, I want to search for issued patents on the subject of collapsible bicycles. As you can see, I can enter the terms in the boxes and select which fields uh, to run the search against. In this particular instance, I'm going to run them against all fields. I can also choose whether to search the full text or the entire database back to 1790. But remember what I said earlier, that the full text is only searchable from 1976 to present. So let's see what we can find when we run the search against all fields. We get 1,074 hits, displayed 50 records per page, showing the publication number uh, and the title of the records in reverse chronological order, so that the most recently published records are at the top. Clicking on the link takes you to the record, but as we can see with this second document, it has nothing to do with collapsible bicycles. It's about a combination water and drinking device. We can, though, refine our search from the hit list thus. Here I've added the term frame, and in so doing, I've reduced the number of hits down to 748. Once again, however, the most recent publication, or I should say the second publication in this particular hit list, is not about collapsible bicycle frames. This time, the subject matter is a wheelchair. Moreover, trying to find my search terms in the body of a document can be painstaking, as the terms are not highlighted in color, simply in bold italics. Let's try to be more specific in our search. Thankfully, the USPTO site allows me to search for a two-word phrase, and again, I can do this by refining my original search, either from the hit list or from the search form. Et voila. By enclosing the term collapsible bicycle in quotation marks and anding the phrase with the term frame, I now have just 78 patents. A quick glance at the result list shows that they're on the subject of collapsible bicycles. Indeed, the very first record shows that it's a folding bicycle, an alternative term, but clearly what I'm interested in. More experienced users may prefer the USPTO's advanced search form, but this does require an understanding of the field indexing, syntax codes, and the proper use of nesting terms within parentheses. In my personal experience, the site can be a little unforgiving. Moreover, there's 
a limit to the maximum length of a search string, according to the help page is, the USPTO says that queries which fully expand to lengths of more than 256 characters are not supported. They may not work at all, and they may not return valid results even if they do appear to have worked. I said earlier that I'd been in the industry for more than 30 years, and in that time, I saw search queries that amounted to several dozen lines and literally hundreds of characters. Nevertheless, there's no doubting the popularity of the USPTO site. And for those only needing to search for US patents, it's a tremendous resource. However, we live in a global world, and for some, perhaps most, the need to search outside of the USPTO is important. So the next service we're going to explore is the hugely popular European Patent Office site, Espasnet. Like the USPTO, Espasnet was launched in 1998, but unlike the USPTO, the EPO is not bound by a charter forbidding competition with the private sector. And this has brought the EPO service into conflict with some commercial database providers. Personally, I think that says a lot about Espasnet because it is now a very sophisticated tool offering access, it claims, to over 90 million patents from 80 different countries and regions. Perhaps, though, being sensitive to the commercial database providers, the EPO website publishes seven points to consider before starting your slide. The seventh point being use the right tools. The site stresses that using free patent search tools is not necessarily more cost effective than using fee-based databases. It goes on to say that discussions with patent professionals often reveal that free tools are sometimes too blindly trusted due to the incorrect impression that free services offer as much information, if not more, than commercial databases. The EPO states that users need to be clearly informed on the limitations of free products. It points out that abstracts in a SPASnet are not always available when they're present in some well-known commercial databases, and that you'll often spend much more time finding results than by using fee-based tools. Finally, the EPO adds, the cost of a patent professional spending two hours on a free system are often higher than the costs of such a professional spending 15 minutes on a fee-based system. I don't think I could put that better. Even so, Espasnet is a formidable tool in the right hands. So let's take a look at some of its strengths and weaknesses. Similar to the USPTO site, Espasnet aims to cater for the experienced as well as novice searcher by offering several search forms, including a smart search, advanced search, and classification search. We'll just look at the first option. Because the EPO publishes in three languages, English, French, and German, the Smart Search feature allows users to select which collection they want to search in. Because of the very different scope of the collections on offer in Espasnet, it's not possible to do a direct comparison with the USPTO site, but we will at least use the same search terms. So let's begin by looking again for collapsible bicycles. I'm Going to um, combine the term using the AND operator, and we'll run that search. Now, despite Espasnet's coverage being considerably wider than the USPTO's, you'll see that my search has generated fewer hits, 563 compared with 1,073 on the USPTO. The reason for this is that Espasnet displays the hits as patent families. We don't have time to go into the subject of patent families here, but this is a fundamental difference between the two sites. If we open up the first record, you'll see that it consists of two Impidoc family members, um, WO20161627707, and a Hungarian patent application, HU15 
0155. Uh, the Hungarian application was filed on April the 9th, 2015, and the WO application filed just under a year later on April 7th, 2016. So in reality, two hits, not one. If we were to download the records into a spreadsheet, I'm sure we'd find that the combined total number of records returned by Spassnet was more than those generated by the same search on the USPTO site. But whereas the USPTO displayed all 1,078 hits, a SPASnet is limited to the first 500, and users are recommended to refine their search in order to reduce the number of hits. So let's do that. Again, we'll look for the term collapsible bicycle, but this time we'll search for it as a phrase and we'll add the term frame to our search. Now we have just 126 families, and Aspasnet is able to display all of them. And you'll notice how, in addition to displaying the title, Aspasnet also shows various elements of the record, such as the name, the inventor, the assignee applicant classes, as well as some numbers and dates. Plus, the user can sort the results by various fields, as well as by ascending or descending order, and download the front page of the PDF or export the results into a spreadsheet, all from the result list. It's worth pointing out the third and fourth records um, in our list because you can see that the titles have been terribly misspelled. This is important because had we not searched all text fields and, say, restricted our search to the title only, neither of these records would have been found. And yet, in this next slide, we can see very clearly that the subject matter is correct. To mitigate this, some commercial database providers correct typographical errors and others even rewrite the titles and abstracts to make retrieval easier. The third official free site I'd like us to explore is WIPO's Patent Scope. WIPO, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, came to the party later than either the US Patent Office or EPO. Indeed, Patent Scope wasn't released officially until almost 10 years after the launch of either of the other services. Perhaps because of that, and because WIPO is truly international in scope, rather than national or regional, as is largely the case with the US PTO and the European Patent Office, for my money, or indeed for no money at all, uh, Patent Scope is among the most sophisticated and global of the free tools currently available. The collections consist of almost 60 million records published by more than 40 authorities, and the search interface is available in eight languages, Chinese, English, French, German, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. Now, in this session, we're only going to look at the English interface. But it's not only the interface that's been internationalized. PatternScope offers a range of features to aid and assist in translation, including CLIR, C-L-I-R, which stands for Cross-Lingual Information Retrieval, a tool that can propose synonyms for any keywords you enter. It can also translate your original inputs and the generated synonyms into 12 other languages, as well as offering a statistical machine translation tool that can translate any patent documents from and into 14 different language pairs, including, again, English, Chinese, French, German, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. We'll continue searching for collapsible bicycles, so uh, I'm going to enter those terms into the simple search form, anding them as before. This time, our search returns 2,600 hits, but at first glance, a few of the first 10 records seem to be relevant, so let's enclose the terms in quotation marks and run it again. This is more like what we need. 362 records in total, and 
certainly judging by the first 10 uh, records, they all seem to be in the right area of technology. Note that we can use the machine translation feature to translate record number four um, into English using WIPO's own translation service or other translation tools offered by Google, Microsoft, Bing, and Baidu. In this particular example, I found Google to offer a better translation than the WIPO service. As with the previous searches, adding the term frame to our original search term helped narrow the hits down, in this case, to 277. And in common with the other services, PatternScope has also offers its users the choice of an advanced search form. Unlike the others, though, I can also visualize the results as a bar or pie chart, a feature generally, generally available only on commercial services. Now, before we turn to the fee-based services, I want to touch briefly on a couple of free patent research sites that are not hosted by any of the patent offices. Two of the best known, at least in the US, are Google and the aptly named Free Patents Online. The Google interface will be familiar to everyone, um, and they've retained that simple design for their patent search tool, uh, although there's an advanced search form too. Google boasts fewer records than either Spassnet or PatentScope, and yet using our now standard search terms of collapsible and bicycle, the simple search returns a staggering 104,717 results. The explanation being that while the terms are anded together, Google also includes synonyms for the terms, and these synonyms are then awed together. Removing the and operator and adding quotation marks uh, around the term generates, in Google's own words, about 826 hits. Um, scrolling through the results, 10 records at a time, I was pleased to find that almost all were on topic, but the results ended on page 30, so I was only able to view about one-third of the supposed results. One area of concern sometimes leveled at the free services is that of security and privacy. But Google is at pains to stress its policy in this area, publishing the circumstances under which Google uses information provided through patent search queries. Crucially, they confirm that Google does not inspect Google patents logs to inform its own patenting strategies. This reminded me of um, some trouble that IBM is rumored to have had when they launched the intellectual property network. Word began to circulate that IBM had access to the search strategies being run on the IPN and this led very quickly to several major companies in high-tech banning or restricting the use of the service by their employees. It wouldn't surprise me if this was one of the factors that led IBM to spin off the service in 2000, although certainly IBM was not, like Google isn't, examining the patent search logs. As far as I know, the, the new company, Delphion, was never dogged by those accusations and it went on to become one of the most successful of the commercial patent vendors, so much so that the business was eventually acquired by Thomson, now Thomson Innovation, in 2002 for approximately $22 million. The last free service I want to look at today is Free Patents Online. Although understandably more limited in their coverage than the official sites or, or Google, Free Patents Online offers full text or patent abstract searching of several important authorities, the US, EP, WIPO, German and Japanese patent offices. They don't currently offer access to Chinese or Korean data, so can't yet claim to cover the IP5, a forum of the five largest intellectual property offices in the world, 
that was set up to improve the efficiency of the examination process for patents worldwide. Their coverage does, though, claim to include some non-patent literature, but that's outside the scope of this webinar. Everybody knows the phrase, there's no such thing as free lunch, and this is most definitely the case with free patent search services. You may not be paying a subscription fee to use the services, but someone is funding the service somehow. It may be through general taxation or applicants' fees, as tends to be the case with the patent offices. Free patents online is partially or wholly funded through advertising, and the site makes clear how to advertise on free patents online. Interested parties can advertise via Google AdWords, and free patents online is planning to test Google's AdSense program as a way to help support the site. Under the AdSense program, a site doesn't have complete control over the advertising that it is displayed. Rather, Google picks ads in a context-sensitive manner and places that ad on the appropriate page on the site. In common with every site we've looked at so far, Free Patents Online has a quick search and an expert search form. I thought it was curious, though, that the quick search form offered me a choice of almost 30 boxes to complete compared with the single box on the expert form, the exact opposite approach taken by Google. Using our by now standard search, I entered collapsible and bicycle in the all fields box, having previously chosen all the pattern collections and all years. Word stemming is on and sort order is set to chronological. Free Patents Online is impressively fast in executing the search. But as you can see from the results, hardly any of the first dozen records are related to bicycles, let alone to collapsible ones. Removing the AND operator didn't affect the number of results, but adding quotation marks did. Reducing the hit count to 1,350, although it was not immediately obvious why an orthopedic device for treating complications of the hip uh, is related to collapsible bicycles. I later found that my search term were among some of the cited references. And while not every record was on topic, I was pleased to find that even the very last record, number 1350, had both of my terms in the title. Disabling stemming and setting the sort order to relevance didn't appear to affect the result count, but all 50 records displayed on the first page of results contained the terms collapsible bicycle in the title. The ads at the top and bottom of the results page uh, can be off-putting, and even worse was seeing them show up in the middle of a record. Uh, for some users, however, this will be a very small price to pay for speed and accuracy. In the blog that accompanied this event, I said that some commentators were predicting that the increase in the number of free sites offering patent databases would lead inevitably to a reduction in the number of commercially produced databases. And it's true that some of the early pioneers in the industry are no more. We began by talking about IBM's intellectual property network being spun off as Delphion which itself was then acquired by one of the bigger players. Delphion continued under Thomson Reuters until it was retired along with the Eureka platform just a few years ago. And Micropatent, another early pioneer in this space, has also now been discontinued. But none of these products was necessarily a casualty of the revolution in free patent search engines. They were simply merged into Thomson Innovation, their successor. And if any evidence is needed of the health of the commercial patent research market, we can stay with the story of Thomson Reuters because in July this year, it was announced that Onex Corporation and Bearing Private Equity Asia were acquiring the Thomson Reuters IP and Science Business Divisions, which include Thomson Innovation, for $3.55 billion cash. So how have the commercial database providers confounded their critics 
and survived, nay, thrived in the face of the free competition. Ironically, I would say that they've done so because of, not in spite of the free sector. It's impossible to beat free, right? So players like LexisNexis, Retech have had to focus on adding value. Whether that's the more tangible aspects like breadth and depth of content, timeliness, quality, integration with other IP tools, or softer things like in-country customer support, in-person training, security, customer panels. Studies show that there's a continuing willingness to pay for these things. And the commercial sector has benefited from their free counterparts. As more data is becoming commoditized, organizations, again like Readtech, have invested in acquiring content that is currently available unavailable elsewhere. By standardizing and normalizing names, numbers, dates, organizing collections into, into families, uh, parsing independent and dependent claims, the industry makes it possible to search consistently across more than 100 authorities and over 100 million records. None of the free sites that I've covered today can match these volumes. Further investment in imaging technology means that documents that were previously available only as PDFs can now be searched using complex search strategies. And advances in machine translation technology has meant that hitherto impossible to search in full text collections of Chinese, Japanese, Korean patents can now be searched with the same degree of accuracy as US and European collections. To demonstrate this last point, I've run the same search that we ran against the Patent Office and other free sites in LexisNexis Total Patent 1, a new subscription service that Mike will be introducing shortly. Using only English terms, collapsible bicycle and frame, and searched against the entire collection of almost 107 million records, Total Patent 1 returned 1,100 30, sorry, 1,389 hits, almost all of which appear to be relevant from the first right through to the last record. Another powerful argument is that the explosion of information in general and pattern information in particular has made the need for tools that can cope with this increase even more necessary. It's Easy to forget, but less than 10 years ago, access to Chinese full-text patent information just didn't exist outside of China, despite the fact that their filings were already increasing exponentially from around 50,000 applications a year in 2000 to more than 500,000 in 2010. As of 2014, that number has risen to almost a million. And China has consistently been the number one filer of patent applications since 2010. If the absence of Chinese data was not bad enough, some experts thought that once sources did become available, it might take another five years before reliable English translations would emerge. Today, several commercial services offer access to good quality English machine translations of Chinese patents not just the titles and abstracts, but the full text, including the claims. Indeed, LexisNexis, with their operation in the Netherlands, was among the first database providers to load the complete back files online of English translations for Chinese full text patents. The Patent Information User Group's wiki lists almost 50 mostly commercial services offering multinational patent databases. Their corresponding list of single authority patent databases, mostly consisting of collections offered online by individual patent offices, shows about a dozen fewer. Largely absent from either list, though, are the databases and services on offer in the Asia-Pacific regions. At the annual Japan Fair in Tokyo last week, there were over 100 vendors ex exhibiting at the Science Museum, 
the vast majority of them from Japan, South Korea, and China. We can be pretty sure that around the world, the number of commercially funded patent databases and related services is more than 100. And to think that when I began my career in patent information more than 30 years ago now, you could count the number of such services on the fingers of two hands, and probably without the need to use your thumbs. So far from bringing about their decline, fee-based subscription patent research tools happily coexist uh, alongside the free tools, sometimes meeting the same need, other times meeting needs that simply cannot yet be met from the free tools. And organizations large and small continue to make use of both systems aware of the advantages and disadvantages that come with each. Well, that concludes this section of the webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today. Let's pause here, um, but before I invite Mike Huddleston to walk you through Total Pattern 1, let's see whether Gail has uh, received any questions. Thank you so much, Richard. Yes, I do have a few questions here. Um, first uh, question, what is the market size for all patent search tools? That's a really good question. And actually, um, um, there have been a number of studies for um, the commercial sector, which you know puts it somewhere in the region of um, between half a billion and the best part of a billion dollars. Um, it, it's hard to be precise because where does a patent research tool begin and where does it end? You know, many tools today ha are integrated with um, portfolio management systems, they're integrated with analytics systems, um, but there are also um, free standalone tools that just cater for a portfolio management just cater for analytics. But certainly um, studies that uh, we have seen over the years uh, put the market, I think, uh, in a very healthy state uh, of in, in that sort of ballpark. Thank you. Um, another question. You mentioned one site that offered the means to analyze results graphically. What other features are missing from free sites? Yes, I, I think this is one of the, um, the, the major shortcomings uh, these days in free services. Um, you know, the, the ability to filter graphically or to analyze the records, to put them into charts and graphs, um, to, to download them, uh, it, that's just table stakes nowadays. And so I'm surprised that more of the free tools aren't, su aren't supporting um, graphical analysis. Um, but there are there are many many other things. Um, the use of semantic search these days is becoming somewhat ubiquitous in commercial tools. You know, recognizing that in order to search databases in excess of uh, 100 million records, um, the you know the, the ability to search that data just using standard Boolean search terms um, is just not going to cut it. I mean, what if you don't know all of the possible synonyms for a particular term? Uh, what if um, you're having to search in foreign language collections? And certainly, semantic search uh, is an area that uh, I know uh, all of the um, higher-end commercial services are exploring. And it may only be a matter of time before we start to see um, that sort of technology um, becoming embedded in, in free tools as well. Um, there's things like citation analysis. There's uh, limits on, what we've already seen, limits on the number of records that you can display, as Bassnet was 500. Uh, limits on the formats that uh, users can download records in. Um, and limits on the number of documents that can be downloaded at a time. So uh, I expect over time that you know, many of the free services will be encouraged to add those features and functions to their tools. This brings them somewhat closer, you can argue, to the commercial sector, but it also then just forces the commercial sector to raise their game 
uh, and to look for other areas where they can add value and where they can justify their subscription costs. Thank you. Um, another question. What are the latest machine learning technologies available in products? Machine learning. Um, so I, Sammy touched upon that in when we were talking about semantic search. Um, certainly, uh, indexing is um, is growing again exponentially, um, as is the, the use of uh, machine translation. Um, I think you have to be a, a little bit careful, especially when you're dealing with um, patent search professionals, because one of the things that I have discovered over time is that patent search professionals are very wary of the black box approach. Um, they want control um, of their search terms. They want to be able to see why results have been returned. Um, and you know the development implementation of machine learning. Um, there's dangers that for some patent research professionals, um, it may end up bringing back results that they are simply unable to reproduce themselves, and therefore will struggle perhaps in having faith in. But certainly, as you know, we're already in excess of a hundred million records, um, and. Um, standard search technology is just not going to be able to cope with that down down the road. Thank you so much, Richard. I think at this point.